Well, as many of you know, we hosted an emergency warming shelter this past week. Half of all homeless in the city in shelters were in this building. And on the final night, the count was 206. A week ago last night, there were still seven who froze to death on the streets of Colorado Springs. I want you to watch this video, which aired on Fox News 21. Fox 21 is Colorado Springs experiences record breaking freezing temperatures. One local church is opening its doors and making sure no one has to sleep out in the cold. Fox 21's Ria Jha tells us how this church is saving lives. Yeah, Rachel. So if you've been outside, you know that it's freezing. So the first United Methodist Church turned itself into a warming shelter and has taken in hundreds of people that are homeless over the weekend. As cold feet step through the doors of the First United Methodist Church in Colorado Springs, this is your first time in? they're greeted with warm smiles and open arms. Right. So glad you got over here. How are you? I'm good. I'm Carrie. Hi, Carrie. What's your name? The shelters were filling up fast, and there was a desperate need for some space. And so I just made a call to some of my team and said, Hey, what is it going to take for us to open up our church and let people come in and sleep and be warm? Since the church opened its doors as a warming shelter Friday night, Carrie West says she's only gotten a few hours of sleep over the past couple days running the shelter. To think that these people who have now become some of my friends could have died. And so us being able to do this, it's probably the greatest impact we can have in the community. We literally saved over 100 lives. On Sunday, the National Weather Service reported a record-breaking low of negative 8 degrees in Colorado Springs. Within 15 minutes below 8 degrees, you, you begin getting frostbite and stuff like that. And I would hate to be out there in the tent when, it was, when, it, when it's nighttime and stuff like that. I don't want to be, want to be outside. It's like nerving. It's the church is accepting anyone and everyone at any time of the day or night until they close Tuesday morning when the weather is supposed to warm up. The community stepped up over the weekend with hundreds of pounds of food and other donations. People are doing just as much as they can and it's really like beautiful to see. The guests that have come in are more than thankful and not just for the place to stay. They talk to you just like you're a normal person in their community at their church, you know, they, they teach you with respect and so, kindness. Explain to me a little bit more about your situation. That you, they need to be heard, helping people regain some dignity, some hope. It's really very fulfilling. It's worth not sleeping for. <laughs> there were over 50 volunteers from this church alone who gave of their time during that warming shelter to make sure people had food. It was amazing the power of a commercial kitchen that made enough spaghetti to feed 200 people. This morning, one of our homeless friends bought, brought a thank you card that had been shared around, you just hold it up there, that had been shared and they had signed as a way to thank this community for opening our doors to them. That is an amazing testament of what it means to share love with those in the world. Amen? Amen. I will say, we learned a lot. We're still learning. <laughs> Days later, a lot of lessons. Um, things that we had no idea, uh, ways in which we were utterly unprepared, uh, and ways in which it was a powerful moment. Uh, one of the things we got was a glimpse into what it means to actually be unhoused. In that video, there's a pretty critical line that I want to highlight. Uh, Gabriel, the young man, said, they talk to you like you're a normal person in the community. You know they treat you with respect and kindness. And I want to say, I think it's important to recognize that our folks without homes are not always treated with respect. They are called names. They're called dirty, unworthy, lazy. Rarely are they called holy. Rarely are they called a beloved child of God. For the past several decades, I think the Christian church has gotten stuck in standing up for what we are against and not what we are for. 
We're against anything that's different, that's out of the normal, or we're clear we're against things like cuss words, we're against dancing, or we're against gambling. I remember in high school, I had a Bible. It was called the Extreme Team Teen Edition. And the top of it said, no regrets. And inside were all these extra pages about the behaviors that would make you not be holy. Christianity has for too long been focused on upholding some sense of moral superiority, of identifying an enemy to go to war with. And it's not specific to any ideology. The religious right has pointed to the sins all around them, and the progressive left has shamed into alternative behaviors. Even baptism has become moralized. In so many churches, baptism is framed as this cleansing ritual. It cleanses you from your dirtiness or your your moral failings. Instead of a moment to claim your belovedness, a moment to say, I belong to God. The struggle is if God is holy and everything God created is holy, then what are we talking about? In Jesus' gospel, in John's gospel today, there's two perspectives I think are important for us to encounter. The first is the writer John's linguistic perspective. John uses the word holy. And the etymology of the word is it comes from the Germanic language dating to 500 BCE. And it doesn't mean set apart. It means uninjured, healthy, complete. It's a, it's a different framework of the word holy. And the other thing to remember is when John is writing this passage, it is after the resurrection. So John knows how the story ends. He's using this word to frame it in that the disciples are no longer hiding in the upper room. They're no longer confused and scared. They're no longer set apart as incomplete. They are whole. They are together. That is a powerful way for us to frame the word holy. And then there's Jesus' invitation for us to see this word holy in a different perspective as well. I want you to imagine Jesus is in that Garden of Gethsemane among those olive trees. He's sitting on a slab, some sort of stone slab, and he is praying. And in all the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is praying that something else is going to happen here. We know he says, God, take this cup away from me. But in John's Gospel, he's praying for the disciples. And not really for Peter and James and John. He is really praying for us. And his prayer is that where the Pharisees see holiness only for certain people, that those who call themselves Jesus followers will know they are never separated from God's love. And that any separation would make them feel unholy. It means that when we claim things are unholy, it just isn't true. There is actually love in those we claim unholy. And to see anyone as unholy or claim anyone as unholy actually only separates us from God's love. Martin Luther King Jr. put it another way. He said, we need to get rid, we never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate We get rid of an enemy by meeting, by getting rid of our apathy and our hostility, but seeing that love is still present within them. Christianity has looked at anything that is unholy and we have banished it and incarcerated it or incinerated it, ignored it, buried it, thrown it away. And when we talk about church being complicated, there's a reason people struggle 
to walk in the doors of a church. Because for too long, they have been called unholy. I want you to imagine for a moment with me, what if we got rid of religion? What if there was no Christianity? Imagine that there's no institution. There's no movement. There's no community dedicated to human meaning, dedicated to figuring out human morality or the imagination of a better future. Imagine that there are no advocates out in the world who are dedicated to the development of human wonder and generosity. Imagine that there are no traditions that are preserved, passed from generation to generation to generation. Imagine that there's no network of spiritual communities, no Catholic nuns serving the poor, no evangelical missionaries caring for the addicts, no mainline Protestants seeking to care for the homeless. Imagine the loss in our world if there was no religion called Christianity, all because we claimed people were unholy. We have to make a different choice in the world today. We have to see that everything, everything has value. And if we say everything has value, we have to look at the things that we don't understand and we don't agree with and we think are unholy and struggle to look at them through a different light because there is a separation from God's love. Maya Angelou has this poem. It's called Church. It's sacred. And it goes like this. Everything in God's world is sacred. Trees and toads and little girls' eyes. Grandfather's hands and the murmuring voices of lovers. Sacred. A poet's dream, almanac compilers and rocks that look up to the moon. Sacred. Church is where I go when I want a certain fulfillment. And church is where I don't have to go because it is always with me, holding me up, propelling me forward, sustaining me. When I think about church and remember that church and I are one, I am reminded that everything in God's world is sacred. Everything in God's world is consecrated. May we live this truth this day and always. Amen.